Hi. Now, today what we will discuss is what is biomedical engineering. So today, <clears throat> we want to understand the sub-disciplines of biomedical engineering with examples. So we will cover uh, the following order. Physiological modeling, biomechanics, bioinstrumentation, biomedical imaging, and biomolecular imaging and biotechnology, systems biology, and bioinformatics. Continued from last time, these are the list of subspecialties of biomedical engineering. And there are several examples I, um, that I covered a little bit. So as a first topic, I want to introduce about physiological modeling. So this is understanding and prediction of system behavior by use of mathematical models of the physiological systems. So for example, we would like to model blood flow in a vasculature or vascular network. Or we also want to uh, model the networks of chemical reactions within the cell. So even single cell, inside the cell, there are inputs from outside of the signal. Uh, and inside the cell, there is nucleus. And with respect to various information, catch it from the outside. And it will generate uh, expression profile of gene. And, and this chemical reaction is so complicated, but our knowledge now is trying to understand these chemical, biochemical reactions inside the cell so that we can maybe target cancer cells more effectively. And the last one, as an example of modeling of angiogenesis, or we call it as a neovascularization in tumor growth. So angio, which is in here, means blood, and genesis means a new formation. So angiogenesis allude as when cancer or tumor grows, they require to uh, oxygen and nutrient supply. So they secrete factors which will grow blood vessels from existing vessels. So this new vascular growth is called angiogenesis. And physiological modeling allows us to even model this process. Let's say here, this I brought as an example, as from tumor, when the tumor grow and secrete factors, uh, which were new growth, allow new growth of the blood vessel to feed the tumor. So we can have computational modeling of 3D tumor growth and angiogenesis. And even for chemotherapy, which is a chemical treatment to stop the growth of the tumor, that evaluation we could use. So here, uh, this concept of uh, cancer and tumor growth and the relationship with the uh, blood vessel uh, gave us an insight how to treat cancer. So if the tumor grows, depends on the new blood vessel formation to feed the tumor. One idea or hypothesis is we may stop the blood growth or angiogenesis. We may stop the tumor growth. So this is a famous so-called anti-angiogenic therapy hypothesis. So this is a little idea, but a million dollar hypothesis. If we stop new vessel growth, we may stop tumor growth. That the first a new drug called Avastin, which is anti-VEGF antibody drug, uh, which has been approved with a combination of other uh, chemotherapy drugs to stop or to treat tumors. So in that aspect, uh, anti-angiogenic is a, a great concept to combat against a cancer. Now, is there any other situation when the angiogenic growth may be promoted? For example, let's say someone suffers from ischemic uh, heart disease. Um, 
we may want a new vessel growth to help the organ which is affected by ischemia, which is a loss of blood supply, adequate blood supply to the tissue. So in that case, we can call it as a pro-angiogenic therapy. Now, as a second example, uh, here I put um, uh, this airway. So here you can see you have to be familiarized yourself with these some of the terminologies of anatomy. So this is a trachea and there's a right bronchus and left bronchus. It's called left main bronchus and right main bronchus. You can see there are big lobes are a little asymmetric and from here, uh, from the throat, gladius and trachea and left main bronchus. So modeling of these air flows in the bronchi can be important for some patients. So evaluating breathing patterns for patients with different lung diseases and quantifying the extent of disease in a particular patient may be important. So here we use a physiology and engineering approaches to model this and solve a fluid mechanic problem so that you can see these a velocity map, which is a vector map, and even the speed can be color coded at different time and compute impedance, boundary condition, constant pressure, boundary condition, etc. Now, I want to discuss about bi biomechanics. So biomechanics is studying the structure and function of biological systems using principles from mechanics. So just imagine this is a part of uh, a femoral bone of your leg, big thigh. And we want to replace uh, this with uh, prosthetic prosthetics. So some patients who had a problem in this um, joint, so we could have these uh, artificial hip joint. So to, to develop this uh, prosthetic hip, uh, we need to understand the strength of these biomaterials in mechanical point of view. And what we need is to understand kinematics and kinetics applied to human Gait. Gait is a manner of walking. And we want to design mechanical replacements for hips, joints, heart valves, and various organs which uh, is performing mechanical function. So first, mechanics. What is mechanics? It's a branch of applied mathematics studying motion and forces that produces motion. And here I, I mentioned kinematics. And kinematics is the motion of bodies and systems without consideration of the forces. So only the geometric uh, relations are important in kinematics. On the other hand, we also need to understand uh, kinetics, or we call it as a dynamics. So that dynamics now we start to consider the forces, the so relation between external forces and their effect on motion. Of course, this derives from the famous Newton's law of motion. Just to note to you that uh, in chemi chemi chemistry, uh, chemical kinetics, uh, that kinetics actually means the rate of chemical reaction in chemistry. So to model, you know, to design this artificial joint that replaces a human hip, what would be necessary? So design of prosthetic hips, we use mathematical models of hip mechanics to predict the stress and strain that these artificial hip must endure. So that mechanical cons consideration is very important. And also you can see in B that this hip joint, which is a ball and socket joint, and there, there are considerations. So a metal hip implant with polyethylene cup to lubricate. 
It's not only mechanical, but uh, also uh, lubrication has to be under consideration. So this X-ray images uh, shows what is going on after this replacement. So when we talk about mechanics, we can consider maybe big scale. However, our body down to the tissue and cell and even inside subcellular organelle and that molecular level, there are forces and motions involved. So even when we talk about biomechanics, that can get down to the cellular level too. So here I brought some examples of biomechanical assays used to probe cellular properties. So even we want to know the mechanical properties of the cell and that complicated interaction with the environment is, can be very important in some situations. So for example, mechanical functions of cells such as cell motility. So we know that uh, when there are um, outside inserts such as bacterial attack or viral infection, our immune cells are very, very motile. This motility could be very important for our immune function. Also, another example is a cancer cell. So if cancer cells grow in one side in a primary position, it may not be that uh, life-threatening. The problem of much of cancer death is from so-called cancer metastasis, which requires a cancer cell to grow, becoming invasive, and crawl out of its initial position to move to distant place where they explode, which become very difficult to treat. So for this process requires cancer cell to move, and that involves a mechanical function. Another example of biomechanics is biofluid mechanics of cardiovascular and respiratory system. So in a, some way, our body, especially cardiovascular or respiratory function, is very, very much mechanical too. At the same time, <clears throat> we also consider in biological tissues the heat and mass transfer. So let's go back to the basics of biomechanics. I mentioned previously <clears throat> to design this to, to have a function which will last for years. We need to understand the basic stress and strain. So stress is uh, defined as a force per unit area. So for example, in a, in a compression mode or tensile mode, <clears throat> we can compute stress by force per unit area. At the same time, all these biomaterials can <coughs> have a stretch or compression and that will deform. So to define this relative deformation, we can make a definition of measure of deformation, which is relative displacement. So strain, is defined as the, the amount of change so <clears throat> strain <clears throat> is when there is an, a force let's say extent then <clears throat> the amount of displacement divided by its original length so that it can be normalized in relative displacement in this interesting chart uh, you can see <clears throat> how we can probe a cellular mechanical properties. For example, we can use atomic force microscope to, to use a cantilever to measure very fine nanometer accuracy to poke, to, to poke on uh, the cell surface with a functionalized probe to see, to take it away or push to measure the cellular mechanical property near the cell surface. Similarly, we can use magnetic bead to code to attach on a cell and this magnetic bead, you can use external magnetic field to twist and then how the cellular um, <coughs> mechanical response to be measured. 
and also cyto indentation, which is cyto means cell. Indent is you are poking the cell, <laughs> and then you can measure the cell's mechanical property. Another fancy way is the so-called laser or optical tweezers, which requires a laser light to focus down uh, through a silica bead, and these uh, optical intensity gradient, uh, you can grab a silica bead, which uh, is attached to, for example, red blood cell. You can stretch the red blood cell with a defined force and then measure the displacement, which gives the mechanical uh, property of the red blood cell. Or E, you can see this microplate stretcher, which attaches the cell on the other side, and then you can exert a defined force and you can measure the displacement. And F, uh, this is using a microfabricated post array detector. So you can see the cells are sitting on top of this pillar post, which we know exactly the mechanical property. So this is a pattern surface and you can see from the top view when the cells move or spread they exert forces their bottom, which is these posts, and you can see the posts movement and displacement uh, from the wide field of view. Then you can compute which part of the cell uh, bottoms are actually extending or contracting, and you can even compute the amount of force exerted because you know the mechanical property of these uh, posts microfabricated posts. And then G, you may have seen something like this in in vitro fertilization a movie. So this is called micropipette aspiration. And this is a cell and you can have a tiny micropipette. Let's assume that you can suck it. Then if you have, you know how much of pressure of suction force and you can measure the displacement of cell membrane to be inserted then you could compute how where the mechanical the cell stretching property. And H, you can see on top of a substrate, the cell, or you can see shear flow. And this may be very important for studying uh, endothelial cells, which is a lining cells inside our blood vessel, because blood, there's always a flow, and the, the property of the flow and these endothelial cells interactions very important in some disease such as atherosclerosis. And finally, this substrate structure is you can use the substrate as a soft membrane and you can label focal adhesion complex, which is like a food process of a cell and you can label it in this case with a blue and you can use imaging when the, how the cell exert forces to the soft membrane to compute and understand the cell's force on its substrate. This is a reference, but we will talk about heart. So I want to show you the heart movement. So this is the uh, human heart animation, very realistic from Wikipedia. And this heart, uh, you can see this is the left part from what we see, but however, this is right side of that. So what you are seeing is like humans facing on you. So this is right ventricle, this is left ventricle, and on top, this floppy part is right atrium, and this is left atrium. So <clears throat> most of you probably know, but in a quick summary, so our body, the used body, which uh, consumes oxygen and nutrients, will come into right atrium, via superior or uh, inferior vena cava, and that blood will pass through this uh, valve into the right ventricle. This is deoxygenated, so it has to go to the lungs to fill with, with the new fresh oxygen and exchange its CO2 content. So it has to go to lungs, sorry, uh, to the, it's called pulmonary artery, because pulmonary means lung. So the important thing is from the heart, when the blood comes from the heart to outside, we name it as an artery. 
while this is deoxygenated blood. So you can go to a right side of the lung, left side of the lung. And once it replenishes with a new oxygen, then it can come back to the heart through the pulmonary vein and it goes to left atrium. And through this valve, it goes to left ventricle. You can see left ventricle has the biggest and thickest wall, which means it is the pump in our body. So through that pump of left ventricle, it goes pushing the blood throughout the body. So you can see this aorta. An aortic arch allows the blood goes to upper body and down throughout the body down. So you can watch this and you can notice the sequence of the valve opening because of this flow and direction. Now I want to talk a little more about the disease aspects of the heart. That valve can become diseased and problem for some people. So this is, is an example of a valve replacement. So this is called artificial heart valve. And um, this is coming from this article. So the A is the first animal implant. So throughout the medical history, the suffering person with a heart valve problem, we may, he or she may need a new heart valve. So our human, especially Albert Starr, started animal implant trial. So he developed this by leaflet. You can see these two leaflets, valve with a Dacron single layer sewing ring so that you can suture into the existing heart. And he actually put it into an uh, implant in a dog two days after there's a problem in the dog, uh, dog's heart. So he took out this heart and examined what happened. So this is left atrial view of thrombotic occlusion. And I have to explain you what is thrombotic occlusion. And here is a thrombosis, means a blood clot formed in here. You can see some of the dark ones over here. And that clot occludes, uh, blocks this valve so that the function of the heart will be uh, compromised. So he come up with, since then, humans come up with a various ways of a better design one of the design of this artificial heart valve is called cage bore mechanical valve. You can even understand from here, this bore, when the flow goes from down this direction, the bore is displaced and flow can go. But in the other direction, when the flow tries to go back, this bore will block, so function as a valve. A valve. So this restraining cage, occluder bore, and suture ring serves as a, a kind of mechanical valve. There's also even another kind, is by leaflet tilting disc, mechanical heart valve. This may make a sound, but in general, these heart valves can last years nowadays. So we have developed this artificial heart uh, quite much. Regarding to this blood clot, I want to explain you about uh, this phenomenon of uh, blood clotting. So a medical condition, if someone has a surgery and lying down in, in a uh, patient bed for a very long time, or some people who have to sit down for hours and hours through a long distance travel, uh, he or she may get in trouble if the blood, if the blood doesn't flow it is likely to uh, clot. So that is a problem. You can see a deep veins of the leg. Uh, there, the veins uh, do not have a lot of pressure difference to force the blood to push. Because of that, the veins usually have this uh, valve, which allows uh, the direction of blood flow only one direction. However, if this is compressed and not moved for a long time, uh, there's a potential that the blood will clot uh, in that location. That blood clotting formed in situ, 
incitement in its original place. So a local blood clot form is called a thrombus. So the same plural form is thrombi. So this I becomes U.S. A thrombus is called this. And this formation at the deep vein is called deep vein thrombosis. And by itself can affect uh, the patient's leg uh, uncomfortable. However, what matters further is when this clot is detached and getting into the circulation in your bloodstream. And that becomes a bigger problem. And this we call as an embolism. So this embolus is it, and plural is emboli. And this is called traveling clot, or even air bubble can form as an embolus, which is a traveling clot. And this has been carried in the bloodstream and later on it lodged in a vessel in somewhere in our body, very likely into our lungs or sometimes it can lodge into the brain. And so the combination of this thrombosis and its main complication and a local inside to blood clot thrombus can travel and that become an embolus. And this complication is called embolism and this can happen together and we call it as a thromboembolism. So to prevent this condition, uh, let's say if the patient cannot move on a bed, so we create uh, this device, which is called sequential compression device. So sequentially compressing the, the affected part. For example, in this case, a leg with a pump can prevent this deep vein thrombosis from happening. So now I discuss physiological modeling and biomechanics. So next time I will in introduce bioinstrumentation.